thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, women and drinking has become a topic that I've become more passionate about as I've worked on campus the last two or three years. Um, come to understand that women are very unique in their relationship to alcohol. Um, and alcohol is very uh, unique in the way it treats the female body, which is very different than men. And so it's something that we need to be aware of and that there's not a lot of talk out historically about. Right now it's a hot topic because there's a great new book out, just came out. Um, it's actually on several um, bestseller, bestseller lists and recommended reading lists called Drink, the Intimate Relationship Between Women and Alcohol by Anne Dowsett Johnson. She is a well-respected journalist, um, also someone who's been in higher education. Um, I forget which university she was. Uh, she was at the VP level at a university and has been very open in her book about her relationship with alcohol and decided to go public with that and to bring attention to women and drinking. I highly recommend it. It's a very easy read. It's a very good book um, if you're interested in the topic. And um, I'll put this over here if you want to look at it before you leave. I also have some handouts and things back here um, for you to look at. Take whatever you want before you go. Um, so women and drinking, or pink drinking as I like to call it, um, is a hot topic now. Before I tell you what I know, I want you to tell me what you would like to get out of this conversation so that it is somewhat collaborative. So I'm just going to pass out some blank pieces of paper and give you just about two minutes to think quietly to yourself about what you would like to answer today. If you could learn something. If you could be inspired or develop an insight, what area would that be in? Or how can I answer a question perhaps that you have? Those are scratch paper, so on the back is junk. So. <laughs> yeah. Evergreen. I've given you a little inspiration here too, a little artwork in case you're coming up with a blank. Perhaps you can just look at that and maybe something comes to mind as you're looking at that. I have found it useful as I've done more teaching and presenting to recognize that we are all different and that I have both introverts and extroverts in the room here. And so I have found that introverts are more comfortable thinking quietly to themselves and then reading what they've written. And extroverts sometimes get inspired when they hear the reading of questions of other people. So feel free if you have an inspiration, if you're an extrovert and you get uh, something pops into your head, um, you don't have to read what's written on your paper. Uh, but so give me some feedback. Tell me what, what have you written there? What questions do we need to try to answer today? Um, I'll just go around the room. Just let me, let me hear what's on your mind. Yes. Okay. Mine, which I don't know, mine might not fit in here because I'm, I'm not sure what this is going to be about. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing it's going to be about sexual assault and how men kind of can take advantage of women. But I thought of something else, which I hope nobody in here judges me for this, but I'm a drinker. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not an alcoholic, but I'm a, I'm a drinker, and I'm in a band with four guys, and they have very loud friends, and I know that women are not encouraged to be outspoken, we're not encouraged to be very charismatic figures, 
and you know I'm the vocalist so it's my job to be charismatic and outspoken mm -hmm. and all those things that a woman is not supposed to be and I know that whenever in society you're a woman doing something that you're not supposed to you know we we're told don't do this don't say that don't speak up don't be yourself is alcohol more of a problem for women because we're told that we shouldn't do this and we shouldn't do that and when we drink we're like you know what uh, pardon my language but f you we're gonna you know so i think that mm -hmm. if i that's definitely one reason why my mom started drinking is because she felt socially awkward mm -hmm. and a lot of that comes from being a female and being told to suppress every thing yep. and not be not stand up for yourself and not be confident so it seems like we would reach for something to give us false confidence since our peers and our parents and our society don't want us to be confident mm -hmm. yeah i think you're spot on and it's not called liquid courage for no reason oh. um uh, the challenge is, is that that if we try to match drinks with men, we're going to talk about this, mm -hmm. our body is not made the same as a male body and it actually does more harm to us. So in our attempt to gain voice, we self-harm. Isn't that interesting? So we're going to talk about that. So I'm glad that's on your mind. Excellent. What else? Yes. I think you might, in saying that, I think you might answer my question. Uh -huh. I was asking about like blood alcohol levels. Yes. And what are the differences? Yes, we're going to go right into that too. So um, at some point, I want to make sure to get to that. That's so important um, because that's concrete information that you can take away. So um, I will get to that no matter what. Okay. Yes. Um, I was going to say, um, my question is, um, do they have any, um, like, you know, AA meetings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Campus. Mm -hmm. Good. I can I answer. Think it would be a good idea sometimes. Mm -hmm. I can answer that one really quickly. Um, got a brochure back here. We have a smart recovery meeting, which is not a 12 step. Do. We do. Um, and, but I also have information if a person prefers a 12 step. Um, my philosophy is that choice in recovery. Well, choice in everything is important. <laughs> We're all different, and so um, there are more than one choice. And there's twelve steps, not the only choice. So. And I was mm -hmm. I had the same question as um, Brett. You know, um, the effects of alcohol. On women gotcha. We'll get to that. Is, is mm -hmm. more severe for women? Yes, it is. Then I do know that. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, alcoholism is a disease too. I know that much. Okay. <laughs> All right. I know a lot about alcohol, really. Okay. Oh, and I and I should and, and I should say before I before I get to your question is that um, I usually introduce myself as um, I, I usually introduce myself as someone who adheres to what's called the harm reduction approach. So I don't take a moral or ethical approach to alcohol. I take a public health approach. So um, we're all free to admit to whatever we want to admit to in here. I'm not going to judge. I'm not here to tell you not to drink. I'm here to teach you how to drink safely and to talk about some of the unique vulnerabilities that women have in their relationship to alcohol. Yes. And I'm following up, I think, on some of the other questions. Mm -hmm. But um, alcohol has always been called mommy's best friend. Mm -hmm. you know, or mommy's little mommy's helper. little helper now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mommy so, juice. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so and so I'm I'm wondering what would be the first step for helping someone replace that best friend with a better friend, with a real friend. Absolutely. And, and what, are, what are the first steps to to that transition? Yes, and why is it that mommy needs a liquid helper? Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything different, or anyone else want to add to the? Well, I'm sort of interested among the students at ETSU whether um, how much of a problem alcohol is compared to other schools. My okay. impression is it's not quite as bad okay. as other schools. Mm -hmm. And also, as a faculty advisor, mm -hmm. how I could help people in that you know, if they have problems. Absolutely. Yeah. Sort of Good question. If I don't get to that, stay afterwards and I'll help you with that. Okay, you can talk about that. <coughs> Certainly I do a lot of that, um, working with students with addiction or just, just with problematic behaviors, not just um, full addiction. And I do have statistics and we're going to get to that first. Okay. Anybody else? Anything else different? Okay, well, um, I don't want to kill you with stats, but stats are, are good. So um, I don't know if you can see this back here, but let me just point out a few general um, statistics about drinking. And this is in the United States. So we see over here um, all drinkers over 12 years old, so female and male. So in the United States, just a little bit less than half of all women over 12 consume alcohol, which means that half don't, which I find interesting. I thought it would have been higher, but in this country only half of women do drink. 
um, a little more than half of the males. So men in, t in general do drink more than women. Drinkers 18 to 25, this is our traditional college population right here. So we see that it is higher than the overall average, which is expected. Um, 18 to 25 year olds in college drink more than 18 to 25 year olds who aren't in college. So college tends to be an incubator of drinking. So we see 57.5% of the females and 62.9% of the males, very close really. Okay, now look down here. This is drinkers 12 to 17. This is on average, but what do you notice that's different about that statistic there? The yes, this is the trend that we're concerned about, that adolescent girls are starting to drink earlier than males and they're drinking more than males. Now, the guys, as you can see, in college, the guys are ahead. But this is very dangerous drinking for 13, 14 year old girls. So something is going on that the girls are starting to drink earlier and drinking more than the males at a very young age. So what does that say when we know that people often self-medicate with alcohol, what does that say about the psychological state of our adolescent females in this society? Binge drinking in the U.S. Um, Nearly 14 million women in the United States drink, binge drink excuse me, about three times per month. The definition of binge drinking is having four or more drinks in one sitting, which for most women is several too many. Um, for men, it's five or more. So we know that millions of women are drinking to the point of harming themselves several times a month. Okay? Average drinks per binge is six. And when we look at BAC levels, you'll see how much that is for a female. One in five high school girls binge drink. So even though that statistic was overall from 12 to 17, only about 12, 13% drink, by the time they end high school, one in five have had a binge drinking episode. Very high risk. Um, in, in the US in general, we see the gender gap is narrowing for binge drinking. So um, the guys are coming down from a high of, of 62 down. Females are going up. So this, this gap here is narrowing. So women are starting to drink, um, binge drink more than they used to. Men are drinking less, binge drinking less. Interesting, right there. ETSU, this was in 2012, a study that the uh, College of Nursing did, binge drinking in the last 30 days. So these were women that were reporting on their behavior in the last 30 days at ETSU. 55.7% and 60% of the men said, indeed, in the last 30 days that they did drink. The N on this was 593. It was a fairly decent sample. Average age was about 26. So this was um, a fairly decent representation of the population here. 17.8% um, uh, binge drink in the last 30 days. So that's a lot of girls that are drinking. Okay, alcohol-related consequences. Again, same study, ETSU, pink girls, blue boys, regretted something, uh, 25, almost 30 percent of the women, more than the men, regretted something after they drank. Okay. 27% blacked out in the last 30 days. Really? Blacked out. Did, were still fully awake, walking around, doing stuff that they no longer remember. Unprotected sex, you can see a lot of that's going on related to alcohol. One or more negative consequences, look how high that is. So some women and men are having multiple negative consequences directly related to alcohol on this campus. It is true, compared nationally, that we do have lower numbers. Okay, significantly lower, but still in a dangerous area. A lot of negative consequences. Now, this is one that Kate and I have talked a lot about, that um, that many men are having unprotected sex on our campus. So, pregnant females, shocking. 8.5% of the pregnant females in the United States drink when they're pregnant and almost 3% binge drink when they're pregnant. Unique vulnerability, men don't get pregnant, women do. Typical female drinker, as it turns out, single, white, wealthy, educated, working women, all of us, 
that are all of our students that are going to go out into the world predominantly this is what we see these are the people that doesn't mean that others aren't drinking but who is doing most of the drinking this population right here okay not the face that you usually put with a, a drinking disorder now the term alcoholism and alcoholic I want to get that off the table because it's not particularly a helpful um, term for our conversation because we all have an image in our head of what an alcoholic is or what alcoholism is the truth is is that drinking disorders or what we call alcohol use disorder is on a spectrum from I don't drink at all to severe total chaos you do not have to be in chaos to have negative consequences for drinking in fact most of those women that are drinking are not do not meet the full criteria for a severe alcohol use disorder and yet they have negative consequences on a regular basis in their life this is really really important because people use this rationalization that I'm not an alcoholic I don't need help and that's not true it's really not true you can have a mild alcohol use disorder you binge drink you black out you have unprotected sex, you're pregnant. All right, so why are we uniquely vulnerable compared to men? Because this is about pink drinking. Um, I'm going to cover these areas, biological reasons, physiological reasons, psycho psychological reasons, sexual reasons, um, and social cultural reasons. Straight biology, and this is some of the stuff that you asked, asked about, is that um, women's bodies are different uh, biologically than males and so we actually um, we don't have as much of the enzyme that breaks down alcohol in our stomach it's called alcohol dehydrogenase we biologically produce 25 percent less than males it's the enzyme that breaks down alcohol deactivating it before it gets into the bloodstream because we have less than males more alcohol goes directly into our bloodstream than males if I drink a beer and the same size as a guy that drinks a beer my blood alcohol level is going to be higher because his stomach breaks it down mine doesn't as fast so right from the get-go biology typically we have a lower average weight than males do which means we have lower total body water than males we don't we're smaller we are smaller containers you put the same amount of alcohol in a smaller container and the concentration is is higher all right men actually have more uh, water anyway because we have more fat so they have more blood volume so that's another thing um, and also hormonal fluctuations don't really understand this but during um, ovulation we get drunker easier isn't that interesting Re you know right at the time when your body is prepared to have sex and that is when you get drunker faster so very interesting beware of that um, okay faster progression of alcohol related disease you mentioned that over here um, for whatever reason probably because we maintain higher levels of blood alcohol typically than males um, our heart disease liver disease and other problems progress faster in females with a drinking disorder than males so typically you'll see a female start to have problems in her 40s whereas a man might get to his 50s um, we tend to have more um, dementia associated with alcohol use than males again we maintain higher blood alcohol concentrations it's better for our brain Men, uh, risk of breast cancer goes up and then of course pregnancy related risks um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and I think I have this let's see if I have this next slide yeah this is was is just really shocking that uh, prenatal exposure to alcohol is the single greatest preventable cause of neurocognitive disorders in children and they believe that what in lower socioeconomic um, women they call fetal alcohol disorder syndrome in higher socioeconomic females they call it ADD ADHD learning disability because we do not want to associate ourselves with the fact that we harmed our own child by drinking so it, very very uncomfortable to say that but what they think is a lot of it is alcohol related okay women tend to use alcohol to cope with stress more than men men tend to use alcohol to cope more with social anxiety and uh, women with uh, stress role stress and depression 
We tend to have more comorbidity, which means if we are drinking problematically, we tend to have a history of trauma. About 75% of all women with identified alcohol use disorders have a history of physical or sexual trauma in their childhood. 60% are depressed, and it, the suicide risk is greater for female drinkers than for male drinkers. We also are more likely to be a poly substance abuser. So women like to mix their alcohol with sleeping pills and with things like benzodiazepines and other prescription drugs, more so than men. So very much more vulnerable in this sort of a situation psychologically. Sexuality. Um, we know that women often make sexual decisions they later regret. Maybe men do too when they're drinking, but we know that women do. Um, we're more likely to have unprotected sex when we're drinking. Um, increased risk of STDs. This is something that Kate and I talk a lot about. You're not thinking condom when you're drunk. Okay? Unintended pregnancies and 75% of all sexual assault and rape is associated with alcohol. So, and one in four to one in five women on this campus will be sexually assaulted during her time in college. Um, so you can see the, the tremendous connection between sexual assault and alcohol use. And most of those uh, sexual assaults are, are being perpetrated on women. So that, again, makes us uniquely vulnerable when we drink. Um, social cultural issues. This is true for males and females, but um, when we drink, we tend to have more accidents. Um, interpersonal violence. 75% of all family violence is also associated with substance use. Who are the pr primary victims of family violence? Females. Um, there's more stigma associated with a woman who drinks, right? Right? A guy can drink and it's almost like something to be proud of. He can hold his liquor. But if a woman who is, is drunk, not so. Um, another big issue for us that makes us vulnerable is that we, t we have more child care responsibilities in this culture than the males. So when we have a substance use disorder, we can't just go to inpatient and get it taken care of because who's going to watch our children? And the, the treatment centers have not, um, for the most part, provided accommodations for women with children. So that's a big problem for us, a real area for um, someone to, to get uh, to do some work in in our, in our, um, in our country. Okay, so why do women overdrink? I'll throw that out there. You, you, you tell me. You probably have a good sense. Why do women drink, do you think? Why do they overdrink? Because kids stress us out. Stress, roll stress, absolutely. It's tough to be a mom and a grad student and, or a mom and a worker, right? Yeah, stress, lack of help. We don't have the resources to manage the roles that our society puts on us or that we take on. Sometimes we take on more than we should, but, okay. Why else do women drink? Relationships. Okay, tell me a little more about that. I don't know, uh, if you're fighting with one of, like, a, a partner or somebody or you just broke up with them or got broken up with. Yeah, so as maybe an avoidance strategy to pain. Yeah. Yeah, so it's difficult to cope with the pain of the relationship. Maybe you don't have the power you need in the relationship, and so instead of doing anything about it, you just drink to numb. Mm -hmm. Or you break up, and it hurts so bad, and you, and you, feel, um, you feel not only disempowered, but alone and vulnerable, and so you drink to numb. Yes, women do that a lot. It's the avoidance um, use of alcohol. Yeah. And what happens when you avoid your problems with alcohol when you wake up the next day? <laughs> They're definitely still there. They may not be worse, but they haven't gone away, right? Yeah. Okay. Why else do we drink? It's the way, too, that we're told to deal with things. I mean, people don't literally tell us, go drink, because they don't really want us drinking. But if we complain about things such as inequality, people are like, you need to grow up and get used to it. That's just the way the world is. They're telling us to cope with unrealistic things, kind of like the role thing you brought mm -hmm. up. But more than that, because a lot of women that I'm bringing feminism into this. A lot of women that don't identify as feminists tell people like me, oh, I would never want to be a feminist because of blah, blah, blah. And they try to say that they're happy playing dumb in order to get <laughs> guys to like them. And they're happy taking the, they try to tell themselves that they're happy and alcohol 
It not only helps people cope with things that they're told they need to just deal with instead of look for other solutions. We don't encourage them to look for solutions. And then other people that are lying to themselves about enjoying feeling like second set class citizens, those people need that to help them lie to themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have something you wanted to add to that? I was just yeah. saying, like, another reason might be because uh, just from, like, using my friends as examples, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to uh, get drunk or whatever, do something crazy because... They use alcohol as an excuse for them to go do something ah. they would normally do. So. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so especially when it comes to female sexuality, when we are given mixed messages about what it means to be a sexually active female. So sometimes in order to overcome the stigma of being sexually active, because we're told, do it, don't do it, do it, don't do it, we have to get drunk to numb these conflicted feelings that we have inside, right? And then you can blame it on the alcohol. And then you can blame it on the alcohol. It wasn't me actually wanting sex. No, I was just drunk. Because as a female in our society, you're not supposed to want sex as a woman, right? Yeah, that's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Women that are in abusive relationships, it's mm -hmm. how they deal with it. Mm -hmm. And what if they're like a, a time wife and their husband's beating them up. And <coughs> Again, coping, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm stuff like that and they're scared mm -hmm. and they drink to try to like to numb yeah and women who have um, a partner with a substance use disorder alcohol or others tend to follow in line and develop their own substance use disorder as well so it's not uncommon for women to turn to alcohol or drugs in response to a partner who uses you know and again Self-harm isn't it interesting. So we feel disempowered. We feel we don't have a voice. We feel hopeless. And so we self-harm as a response to that. You know, so very, very unfortunate sort of cycle that we get into. Um, and then we end up like this, you know, with the, the, I love this, this very famous painting. But if you look at the eyes, what, what does that say? She's sad. <laughs> despairing, no hope, no voice. So how can a woman drink responsibly? Well, it actually is possible, and that's where we're getting to the point here about talking about basic alcohol education. Um, so this is where the rubber meets the road. What you have to know as a woman to drink safely. Okay, this is not what our high school girls are being taught. Um, if, I, if I had it, if it was up to me, I would be going into the high schools in ninth grade and teaching students to drink um, responsibly. <laughs> um, so what you need to know is you need to know what a standard drink is. You need to know what we call the perfect buzz, which is a moderate amount of alcohol that will give you some of the beneficial effects of a little lowered social anxiety, a little emotional warmth, a little bit um, of a lighthearted uh, feeling. The reason why most of us drink when we begin to drink um, we need to know about gender and weight differences. We know how to count drinks, so everyone in here will have their own drink count. It's unique to you. Um, and you need to know the harm reduction strategies so that you can be empowered to drink safely. So first of all, what is a standard drink? Um, three basic types of alcohol that we're going to talk about, beer, wine, and spirits or liquor. They're all different. Okay, so 12 ounces of beer is what we call a standard drink. And that is just, a standard drink is a constant. We've just created it so that we can count uh, alcohol and keep track of blood alcohol concentration. So we, we created it, it's convenient, and it's nice that a 12 ounce beer, that's what a bottle of beer is, 12 ounces, is what's considered one standard drink. It is the same amount of alcohol that is in five ounces of white wine or four ounces of red wine. So. That is actually a half a glass, not a whole glass. So a standard glass is 10 ounces. So a half a glass of wine is equal to one beer. Um, sometimes women tend to get in trouble when they go home and pour a whole glass and think they've had one glass. That's two. If you have a second, that's four. So just be aware of how much alcohol you're getting. 1.5 ounces of 80 proof liquor, that would be vodka, gin, um, that type of thing. That's th about this much. Okay, so a lot of, of young women come to campus here. They get handed something like this at a party. They throw it back. It doesn't seem like very much. They have no experience, and they've just consumed an entire beer in 30 seconds or less. Okay, so very dangerous. If they don't know that, how would they know? How would they know that? 
Um, just so that you know also, a pitcher of beer is four to five standard drinks. A bottle of wine is also four or five standard drinks. So trying to get women to realize that you don't have to finish a bottle of wine, that it's possible to cork it and drink the, the rest of it tomorrow, okay? Or to split. Um, also, interesting things, a pint, I hear this all the time, I just drank a pint. Well, that's the equivalent of 11 standard drinks. A fifth is 17 standard drinks. A handle is 39. I hear from students, we split a handle. You split 40 beers, you split 40 standard drinks, really. Mm -mm. All right. Down here also, 21 shots is the equivalent of 21 beers, just in case you were wondering. So, I don't encourage 21 shots, but okay, so that's a standard drink. So we have to know that in order to count. You have to know what you're drinking. Where students get in problem on campus is they tend to go to parties um, and they drink out of cups, solo cups. They drink out of punch bowls. Usually those bowls are mixed half and half with uh, liquor, 80 proof liquor or more, and something sweet. If you do that in a 12 ounce cup, you now have six ounces of alcohol, which is four standard drinks. So. Young freshman female comes to a party, goes, goes, gets handed something pink and sweet out of a bowl. She drinks one, she drinks two, she's had eight standard drinks, just like that. And then it goes terribly wrong. All right, so what's the perfect buzz? Why is more not better? Well, we know that alcohol, when it's slow and rising, when your BAC is slowly rising, it has a stimulant effect on us. It's pleasant. When your alcohol is high and falling, it has a depressant effect. And almost anyone who's overdrunk has experienced that depressant effect before. That's where you either start crying or fighting. All right, at the end some nods. Okay, so we know that between about 0.05 to 0.07, which is conveniently right below the legal limit of 0.08, is what we call the perfect buzz. It's where you get the most benefits and the least um, negative consequences. So what we try to teach students and to do is to hang out right here, right in the perfect buzz. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, you, you've got to know where you're going to go if you um, depart from the perfect buzz. So here's just a little chart that talks about what's going to happen the more you drink. You're going to become decreased in judgment, self-control, increased sensory impairment, and that's everything, all muscles, including the eyes, which is a muscle, decreased balance, um, increased nausea. By the way, nausea is a sign of poisoning. When you begin to feel sick to your stomach and throw up, that's because your body is saying, get this out of here. I hear students say, I just drink till I throw up and then drink some more. So you drink till you poison yourself and then you drink some more. So um, you see that as the BAC rises, this is sort of the uh, dazed and confused, accidents, blackouts, stuporous, passed out, and then here, um, when you get to about 0.3 or above, you're, you're risking a respiratory distress, coma, and even death. And I see students every year who have BACs like this and are very lucky to be alive. It's just a matter of time before we have a death on campus. I'm surprised we haven't. So almost always, this involves liquor. It's very hard to drink enough beer fast enough because you get full. Okay, so one harm reduction strategy is to limit the amount of, of liquor that you have if you're, if you're having problems or if you're in a risky situation. Okay, so gender and weight. Um, we talked about how women don't have as much of the um, alcohol dehydrogenase, and we've talked a little bit about um, weight. So right from the get-go, women, we need to know that we cannot drink one-on-one -on -one with males. And it's interesting how I hear women equating male drinking with power. I want power, I'll drink like a male, then I'll have power. It's like this distributive property of drinking, you know, that I drink more and I'll have more male power. Well, it doesn't work that way. Um, so right from the get-go, females we need to know we can't, and males also need to know that females can't match drinks with you, and it's not a sign of a character flaw. It's just because they're smaller and their bodies are different. So I really encourage males, this is one thing males can do, is to not encourage females to drink one-on-one -on -one with you. All right, so I'm gonna teach you how to count your drinks. I'm gonna pass out um, a chart here and a little card. And on one side is, our, is for men and the other side is for women. There are some weight categories, so just choose the weight category that is closest to yours.
chart that I have on the slide is a generic chart, but I'm going to show you how to use this to show you how to read the chart. So across the horizontal axis, you have the number of hours that you might be drinking. Down the vertical axis is the number of drinks you might be drinking. And so what I want you to do is to find a two hour and a four hour drink count where you can maintain the perfect buzz, that is to stay under 0.08. So what you would do is you would put your finger on the two and you would scroll down with your finger until you got to a number that was lower than 0.08. Then you move across to the left and that number, which in this case up here is five, is the number of drinks that you can have in two hours and maintain a perfect buzz for your gender and for your weight. So again, on your chart, you'll find two. You'll scroll down till you get to a number under 0.08. You're moving across and then you'll, you'll circle the number. And yours will be different than this chart up here. Does everybody understand that? And then you can do the same for four hours. I like people to have a short party and a long party drink count. So you do the same for four. And that would be called your four hour drink count. I think mine's the same. Am I doing it wrong? Let's see. So for in two hours, you'll mm -hmm. scroll down and you're a, a two, so under 0 0.08. So you're a two, three, oh, okay. two, and then you'll be a three. So that you want to go. Oh, so yeah. you can't be. Points. Yeah. Okay. For for I'm a I'm a two three girl just like you, and it's tricky because it's right on the border. But I always stay with two. So yeah. So you will have a number. You'll have two numbers. I'm a two three girl. I'm a 120 pound female. In two hours, I can drink two beers, and stay at the perfect buzz. I might be what you guys would call a lightweight. That's right. I am. And in four hours, I can have three. I know that if I go over that, the the negative consequences rise in proportion to the number of drinks I have. Okay, yes? So this is talking about like blood alcohol level, correct? Mm -hmm. So this doesn't take into consideration like tolerance to alcohol? That's a really good point. So tolerance is interesting. Tolerance does not change your blood alcohol concentration. It changes the predictable effects the way you perceive. So if you've been drinking a lot and developed tolerance, it's actually the correct term is tolerance to the predictable effects. Okay, so you no longer feel the perfect buzz at 0.05 to 0.07. And so what do you do? You drink more. You never can get back to that perfect buzz because now your BAC is so high, you've gotten into the high falling BAC category, which is the problem with being a tolerant drinker is you never actually get to the perfect buzz again. Um, the solution for that is to go on a drinking holiday. To go on what? A drinking holiday. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Um, cutting back for a period of time, two to four weeks, uh, drinking holiday. Okay. Holiday. What do you think I said? No, I, I heard that. Yeah. I just took a. Yeah, a drinking holiday. Yeah, not as in drink more. No, a drinking holiday. <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but a drinking holiday is actually not drinking as much. So. Um, so much more sense, yeah. yeah. So you're, you actually, your, your tolerance will decrease again. It's a beautiful thing how the body adjusts. So um, if you want to get back to the perfect buzz, you just start cutting back on your drinking and eventually you will. Now if you're, a, if, now if you're a, uh, have to have a drink in the morning in order to steady your nerves, do not stop <coughs> drinking. That is very dangerous. Alcohol is one of the few drugs that you cannot go cold turkey on safely. You, will, you can die. Um, so alcohol and benzodiazepines are two very dangerous drugs. So, so if, if a person were to uh, have withdrawal in the morning and have to drink, I wouldn't recommend a drinking. Yeah, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. So, um, so let's uh, example. I'm a two three. Can someone who is not a two three tell me what their drinking count is? Anybody? Yes. I'm a four six. You're a four six. Uh, excellent. So if you and I were drinking together, we couldn't drink one on one, could we? Okay. But you can have mine because I don't drink, so you can. I'll share my tolerance or whatever. <laughs> Well, if I drank yours, I'd be in more trouble because then I would have mine plus yours. So for a 120 pound female like myself, if I were to have six drinks in four hours, my BAC would be um, 0.161. And let's just back up a little bit here. Okay, so you've got the perfect buzz. I'm very drunk, sloppy drunk, sick to my stomach. All right, there you go. Isn't that interesting? So that's why you have to know your drinking count and not your neighbors or your best friends, your boyfriends, your partners, or whatever. Um, and stick to your own drinking count. 
Any questions about that? Yes. Did you have a question? Oh, no. Yes. I was just going to say I'm a 4'6". You're a 4'6 also. Yeah, very common for males to be a 4'6". You can go one on one. Yeah, yeah. So, and also here's a question. Who wins all the drinking games on campus? Probably much larger folks. Ma large males. It's, it's, you know, is it really a game if we know who the winner is going to be? You know, it's larger males. Yeah. And yet we still keep trying to, you know, win that game. Um, okay. Per, uh, harm reduction strategies. So now that you know what your drink count is, how, how do we as women, or as men as well, um, reduce our harm, knowing that we are more vulnerable uh, in many ways than males? Stick with your personal drink count, which, of course, you'd have to know what that was in order to do that. Um, also, strive to stay within the lowest, drink, uh, lowest risk drinking guidelines. So the National Institute of Health says that women can drink seven standard drinks a week and males can drink 14 and have very little negative consequences as long as you don't drink them all at one time. That's per week. So even, you know, medicine recognizes that drinking isn't always bad for you. You can drink responsibly and have very little negative consequences. This allows a female to have a drink in the evening, a glass of wine. It allows a guy to come home and have a couple beers. All right, very little harm there. Um, so if you stick within your personal drink count and the week count, you're gonna be pretty safe. You're gonna have very few negative consequences. That's the goal, if I could get everyone to, to do that. Other harm reduction strategies don't encourage smaller people to match drinks with larger. So if you're out with me and you really care about me, you wouldn't ask me to drink or drink. Okay. In fact, you would encourage me to stick with my drink count, and I would encourage you to stick with yours. Um, don't encourage females to drag, match drink with males. We already talked about that. A 180-pound guy can have five standard drinks in two hours and have the perfect buzz. A 120-pound girl, and these are just typical weights for college students, so I have those up here. If she has five standard drinks, she's drunk, and that was the example that I showed you. Her BAC is 0 .171, so, um, so they just they can't drink alike. This is tricky for females um, because we have to drink something else in between. What you gonna do? You're, you, you, you know, you consumed your beer and now you've got to stop. So for females, uh, alternating uh, non-alcoholic beverages with alcoholic beverages. Um, if, you're, if you're out um, or pouring a half a glass for yourself, smaller glass, drinking, sipping um, um, slower. But we have to engage strategies that larger people and males don't have to, okay? And we can do it. We can. There's a lot of benefits to doing it. Um, don't drink on an empty stomach. When you have food in your stomach, it slows the um, absorption rate. So another great strategy for females is always eat. Sadly, what I see is women wanting to save their calories for alcohol. And so another vulnerability is they don't eat so they can drink and then they get drunker faster. So another thing I see women doing. Um, most women know don't leave your drink unattended or accept an open drink from someone. I tell women, harm reduction strategy, if, a, if someone wants to buy you a drink, say yes, go to the bar, take the drink from the bartender. You're very unlikely to get roofied by a bartender. It does happen. I'm not going to say that it doesn't happen, but you're very unlikely to. So it, it, you, it's not that we can't accept drinks. We can accept drinks from other people. We just, just don't take it from their hand. Um, I do have clients every year that get roofied that way, so very dangerous. Use the buddy system. I, I don't recommend that males or females drink in the company of strangers ever. Um, avoid mixing alcohol and sex. And again, why is that? Tell me, tell me. Inhibitions are broken down big time. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, the body takes over and the mind is gone. Okay, so yeah, so reduced inhibitions is one of the predictable effects of alcohol. So. Um, if you do, be very careful. Um, Kate would tell you she's, she's gone, but she would tell you uh, and remind you that it's actually illegal to have sex with someone who's under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Hmm. You cannot give legal consent to sexual activity. So, um, of course abstain if you're pregnant. I've showed you the statistic there. We know to abstain if you're driving. And But lastly here, Avoid using alcohol as your primary coping strategy. If you find yourself doing that, or if you find a friend doing that, get help. 
It's, it's okay to intervene, to, to describe to a friend what you're seeing. I see you drinking more. That's a very, um, there's no label there. You're just making a comment. I see you drinking more. I care about you. I'm concerned about you. Let's talk about it. Um, because what we really need as women is more active coping strategies. We need to find our voice. We need to learn assertiveness um, skills. Um, we, need to, we, need to make it, we need to feel like we have a say in our environment and in our world. So what can we do? So this is sort of, we're going to wrap this up with a conversation about where do we go from here. All right, so when it comes to women and alcohol, what can we do? Well, I'll give you just a few things. Is acknowledge the full continuum of alcohol use disorders. So yourself, one thing that you can do is stop using the term addiction, uh, alcoholism, alcoholic, and use the proper term, which is in the new Diagnostic Statistical Manual, that's the DSM-5, which is alcohol use disorder mild, moderate, or severe. The term um, alcoholic is not a diagnostic term. It's not a helpful term. So we can begin using that term. So if you hear someone using those terms, step in and say, oh, you mean an alcohol use disorder. Yeah. Very, very important because when we use that terminology, and, and as we know as, as women, language matters, right? Well, language matters, um, that we can reduce uh, the stigma of getting help because when someone says they have a use disorder that sounds a little different than being an alcoholic right model responsible drinking yourself and when you're doing it use your words as they say to tell people what you're doing I do that myself do you want another drink me no my drink counts too and they go what's a drink count and I then I just launch into a very small I said I only weigh 120 pounds I can only drink two beers you know Teach responsible drinking, teachable moments. I'm go out teaching anytime you can. Advocate for teaching alcohol education at an earlier age. That's a policy change that we can fight for. Um, address and treat the causes of overdrinking. So we were talking about um, trauma, childhood trauma. We need to address and treat the trauma that we as women are going through, men as well but we know that women bear the brunt of trauma in the home. Um, lack of voice, lack of support for our society for the roles that we as women are asked to, to um, keep up with. Um, so yeah, it's about education, but the root cause of over drinking needs to be addressed as well. And advocate for the special recovery needs of women. We have an opportunity now with the health care reform for um, almost, well, every insurance now will have to cover addiction recovery um, services. So now is the time for us to say we as women demand that we have our special needs taken in con con into consideration. Um, that would be uh, same sex. Um, treatment. Women tend to do better when they're in a group of just women in treatment, and they tend to do better when there's provision made for their children or other people they have to care for. So, very, very important. What else do you think you can do? So that's kind of what we can do, but you've heard me, you've heard me talk. What strikes you as something that you personally might be willing to make a commitment to, one small change that you could do that could help address this issue? Well, if I was a parent of a teenager in high school, or middle school, which I'm not, mm -hmm. goodness. Uh, not, not that I don't advocate that people have children, because yeah. I have one. <laughs> but uh, I'm amazed that, you know, I know that i am got 30, 40 years on most folks in this room. You know, as a child, there was no drinking mm -hmm. where we live. Now, granted, that doesn't mean that when we came to college that we didn't go all out. Because you did, you were stymied. You yep. Were, you, were, you were under someone's thumbs. Mm -hmm. So college gave you a, a, you know, broke down that barrier for you. But if I had children in school, I, parents really need to be thinking about the behavior that, that they exhibit at home every day. Mm -hmm. I don't think people should stop drinking. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying... You need to couch that in, I'm old enough to do this and you're not, or something. 
uh, you know. And model point. responsible drinking if you do. Yeah, see if you're yeah. going to. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, as far as the liquor cabinets in this town, we've got plenty of them now. And whenever I was a teenager, we did not. So you've got a, you have a barrier that has been broken down there that could be, it could become very dangerous. I can see how that many of us have alcohol disorders. We do. Mm -hmm. Mild. A lot of people have mild alcohol disorders. In life now, yeah. But if, you know, that was not the case. Yeah. I, I tell I tell students that if you've ever had a hangover, you've abused, you've abused alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> At least once, right. you know, you have. Um, one of the challenges for underage drinking right now is um, that it's very easy to to get a fake ID. So you can just order them over the internet. Well, and so um, our community is not decided to put resources into truly policing um, the use of fake IDs. So you can just go right up here to one stop. I'm, I'm not picking on them, but they just happen to be right here. Um, all the students I see have fake IDs. They come here, they're 18, they, they get their fake ID. Go right down there, nobody's checking. Ordered off the internet, comes from China. I really like this, mm -hmm. um, and I think that they should be, this chart and these cards should be posted at liquor stores and bars. Of course, that, they won't do it at the bar because mm -hmm. then they'll cut their revenue, but it should be available for people who don't know. Yeah. And I've never, you know, as far as a chart like this, I haven't seen one of these ever in my life. I know. I haven't seen Especially with differences with the mail. I know. So why aren't we doing that? It's so simple. We just spent an hour. And and how hard was it? It wasn't hard. I will address something on that. It is mm -hmm. actually against the law for bartenders to willfully, uh, mm -hmm. to, yeah, to, yeah. yeah, to willfully get people um, past their legal limit. Um, so the, I would see no problem putting them despite revenue. Mm -hmm. But um, I had a question. Mm -hmm. I actually came here with a question. Mm -hmm. I have a, a friend in mind. That, mm -hmm. um, when you want to when you want to bring something like this to mm -hmm. somebody mm -hmm. what are some examples of something like to bring this to somebody mm -hmm. like, so how do you start that conversation yeah, i'm looking at this this is like this is very helpful but i'm not going to be like hey look at yeah this. yeah so um first i'll tell you and I, I we do have a few minutes so i'll tell you that this is another important piece so there are you guys familiar with the trans theoretical model of change stages of change theory anybody in here Okay, you, you're familiar with this. Okay, people do not change behavior overnight. Nobody does. As humans, we are resistant to all change initially. And so we know that people go through predictable stages of change. The first stage is called pre-contemplation or denial. So when you are talking with somebody that's in the denial stage, you have to be very careful because the stages are denial or pre-contemplation. I don't have a problem. Contemplation, well, maybe I have a problem, but I don't want to do anything about it. Next is preparation. Well, I have a problem. I think I need to do something about it. Let me go talk to a counselor or maybe I'll search out on the internet some information. Then you have the action phase, which is when you're actually working towards changing your behavior. And then you have maintenance where you've been doing it so long it's natural. Theory says you can only move a person one stage at a time. So if you have someone in pre-contemplation or denial, the best that you can do is just get them to start thinking about the fact that they might have an alcohol use disorder. You're not gonna get them to stop drinking in one conversation, and that's where most people go wrong. All those interventions that you see on TV, no. No, you're trying to take someone from pre-contemplation and put them into action in 30 minutes. It doesn't work, and those people typically relapse. Um, well, they almost always relapse, so. Um, and relapse is normal, but it is more problematic when you try to move someone too fast. So basically, pointing out behaviors with concern what we call crucial conversation. You, you make an appointment to speak to them. I, there's something I want to talk to you about. And they'll say, what, I'd prefer we talk later. Set that side of time, the time aside. Decide how much time you're going to give to this. And then just describe what you've seen. I've noticed, blah, 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 and I'm concerned. And then you stop. You don't start to try to make them do anything. You just, just get that in their head that you're concerned about them and see what they say. They may say, well, you're right, you know, and then you've just moved them to contemplation. Just, so, and that's all you can do. And then you let it go. And then you go back to it and work, work through the stages. And when they're in prep, ready to go to preparation, you've gathered information. You've maybe got some counseling center brochures. You've maybe got this chart. Hey, the other day I saw this chart. Would you like to look at it? I learned something. Then you move them to preparation. 
And so do you see how that works? I think where my friend is at, um, maybe you can help me classify mm -hmm. where this is. Mm -hmm. she, she knows that it, there's probably, probably drinks too much. Okay. She's found herself in situations that she's probably regretted. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she knows that there's something there. She makes light of, you know, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't go to There's that term, right? Mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, so I guess using that that's a problematic thing that might be helpful. Yeah. Um, so where, where is that? She knows there's something. Yeah. So she's in the contemplation phase. She's not in denial. She's been thinking about it. She probably thinks more about it than you realize. Probably feel, has some guilt. She certainly has some regrets. So your timing is tricky. You know her best. But um, like you could say today, you know, hey, I just went to that class and I've been thinking, you know, maybe about a conversation you've had in the past. I wanted to show you something. And uh, you're just providing information. You're not telling her what you think she should do. Because the minute we tell what someone to do something, what happens? Resistance. And what we know in stages of change is they go back a stage. You push her back into denial if you push too hard. So maybe just showing her the chart. I've got uh, some information over here. Um, and, but going through it with her, out of concern for her. Does that answer that? Yeah. Stages of change. Stages of change, my favorite theory. And I love it because it's trans theoretical. You can apply it to everything. It's like it's one of those meta theories. So, um, Well, I think we're out of time. And um, is there anything else that I can answer or help you with? Um, I'll point out some of the things I have back here. Um, I'd like everyone to take um, at least one, maybe multiple of Drinking advice for women. This is the pink drinking. Some of them are pink and some of them are white. You're welcome to, you can take all of them, as many as you want. Um, this is written um, by a woman, myself, two women. I use the term we in here, so it's, it's really for, for women by women. Um, I've also got um, just some other stuff back here. Completely unrelated to drinking, home for the holidays, how to ma manage going back. I that one was okay, pretty, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And for your, just for coming, sober sex, sticky notes. Okay, so you're welcome to take a couple of those <laughs> as well. All right. Thank you guys. I really enjoyed it. Okay.